All right, good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for joining us for the first of our four Northeast Tree Fruit IPM Working Group Winter Webinars. Uh, formerly stupid questions, we've decided they're advanced enough now that they can just be questions. Um, so today, you know, we got a lot of your feedback and a couple of topics that came up a few times was, was climate change and really what it's gonna do to the tree fruit industry here in the Northeast and you know, with that in mind, what are going to be some mitigation steps that we might be looking at in the next couple of years? So we assembled a, a group of speakers for us all today. We're going to have Debbie Aller from Cornell University, Jason Londo, also of Cornell University, and then Jessica Waite, who's joining us from USDA out in Wenatchee. Uh, so keep all your, your Washington comments to yourself. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> um, and again, this is a pretty informal group, so we'll go through, but if you do have questions for the speakers as we're going along, feel free to jump in and we'll get those addressed. Um, so with that in mind, I think I'm going to turn it over to Debbie, who's going to give us a background on where we expect climate change to impact tree fruit production within the next few years here. So Debbie, I'll go ahead and turn it over to you and let you share your screen if needed. So Maybe Yeah, thanks so much, Mike. That. Sorry, th thanks, Mike. Actually, could you go ahead and let me um, share my screen? It says it's disabled, so. But you should be um, good now. Everyone... Okay, should be, there we go. Great. Um, let's see, I'm just gonna put it in presentation mode. So uh, is that good? Look good presentation? Yep, that looks good for me. Perfect. Well, thanks so much, Mike, for the invitation to join you all today. Um, as Mike mentioned, I'm at Cornell University. I'm an extension associate um, with the Cornell Soil Health Program and really the New York Soil Health Initiative. So most of the time, and as many folks on this call know, I'm usually talking about soil health and soil management um, and thinking about uh, soil health and orchards as well as been a big part of the work I've been doing the last um, couple years with with other colleagues, but today I'm wearing um, a different hat, something I've been involved with for about two and a half years now, which is the New York State Climate Impacts Assessment. Um, so I'm gonna be strictly talking about this in the context of perennial fruit crops, um, but this is part of a much larger project that's been happening since um, September, 2021. Um, and so Mike and Janet had asked me to just give an overview of what we've been doing um, around this, this climate impacts assessment. So for folks who are um, familiar with Climate, um, and specifically the chapter that Dave Wolf led um, in 2011, this was at the time a overall assessment of the climate impacts to the agricultural sector. And there are other chapters focused on other sectors of the New York state economy, um, being like transportation, buildings, fisheries, things like this. But Strictly, we're talking about agriculture, um, and today, obviously, perennial fruit um, crops. And so the New York State Climate Impacts Assessment, which should have been um, released already, and actually um, an interim uh, chapter was released um, at the State of the State by Governor Hochul last week. So some of the projections are actually publicly available now. Um, the broader agricultural chapter is not. Um, but if you click on this link um, I've provided at the bottom here, you'll be able to get um, all the information essentially that I'm going to be presenting today um, on the climate projections. And then um, in hopefully another few weeks, the, the greater chapter in the overall climate assessment. So essentially, long story short, this is a update of the climate impacts to New York State since 2011. Um, and it really focuses less on mitigation because we know we're all feeling the impacts of climate change, but much more on the adaptation side of things and what growers and farmers across various um, crop production systems can do to actually adapt to the impacts of climate change. So this is a, it was a rigorous assessment. It's written in um, the same way the IPCC climate assessment was written or the US national climate assessments were done. So there's traceable accounts, there's evidence for all key findings that we present, which I'm not gonna share today, but what will be published in the future. It was a peer reviewed 
um, paper. It will be published as a special issue in the um, New York um, annuals of or Academy of Science. So um, I'm happy to share the link with this group at a later date. So with that, I'm going to move a little bit more um, about the assessment that it covers all aspects of New York State, everything from Long Island to the Champlain Valley, where Mike is, to Western New York. Um, and for us, it touches upon agriculture across New York State. So within the agricultural chapter, myself and colleague Allison Katrigan were the co-chairs, but I really, for this talk and um, a lot of the information that I'm going to present today, actually, um, Greg Peck was the one who wrote this section. Um, and we had several um, key sector advisors um, who are perennial fruit growers, namely Ted Ferber. Um, actually, we had Suzanne Hunt. Um, and then um, Dale Isla Riggs, who is a small berry grower. Um, so getting into some of the overall impacts that um, have been observed and are projected to occur in New York State moving forward um, are changes in, in temperature. I think everyone is aware of this, but these projections, I will say, were developed by Columbia University specific for this climate assessment. Um, so they're really taking the latest data that's available um, and using several different climate projection models um, for this information. Um, so I think as everyone's well aware, it's getting hotter in New York State as it is in most of the country. Um, and here are some just temperature ranges that you can see that by the end of the century across New York State, depending on where you are, within the state temperatures could rise between five to 11 degrees Fahrenheit. And so I think everyone is well aware of this. We know it's getting hotter, but here's the data that's really showing that this is happening and it's going to continue to get warmer um, across the state. But when we think about temperature and specifically for perennial fruit crops, right, we're thinking about temperature extremes. Um, and I know Jason can speak a lot more to this and will, but overall, um, extreme heat. So during the growing season, this is really leading to um, physiological disorders, um, for example, sun scald. And this is really impacting the quality of the fruit and the ability of our growers to sell and market their product. Um, and then I think everyone is well aware of the frost damages that is occurring um, earlier bloom with warmer winters, um, typically followed by these, these late frosts. Um, it happened 2012 was a really dramatic one. And then just this past year, right in 2023, um, growers were saying they lost, some lost 100% of their crop this past year because of that early uh, bud break followed by um, these deep uh, frosts. And so this could also be impacting and is likely to impact um, uh, pollination because it can affect things like honeybees um, and other pollinators, which are important, important for uh, perennial fruit crops. So it's not just that we're warming across New York State, but it's really we're having these temperature extremes. Um, here are just some images, uh, the projections for precipitation across the state. So we're not only getting warmer, but we are getting wetter as well. Um, but the one thing I think everyone knows when it comes to precipitation, once again, it's these extremes. It's varying more widely from year to year. We tend to get more precipitation now in the winter and spring, and summers are tending to be droughtier. So once again, the impacts are going to vary slightly across the state or will vary um, in terms of uh, potential percent increase in precipitation by the end of the century. But statewide, New York State is getting wetter. Um, when it comes to plant hardiness zones, once again, these are shifting um, with our warmer winters. We're getting longer growing seasons. This is not so much um, critical, let's say, for perennial fruit crops as some options for annual crops in terms of being able to double crop, triple crop, um, and utilize protected culture a bit more. But overall, plant hardiness zones are shifting across New York State. So currently, a place like Long Island, which is zone seven, um, potentially by the end of the century is going to be a zone nine planting zone or plant hardiness zone. So this is going to affect the crops that are um, going to be able to 
be planted, but also create some new market opportunities for growers as well. When it comes to pests, I think everyone's well aware of this, um, that pests are increasing. Um, this is the, the image here on the left is just an example I pulled off from this really great resource if folks don't know about it, but I'm sure everyone does, that in the, the purple is an invasive weed currently where it is present, but with climate change, invasive weeds that are not present in New York State are going to be present. They're gonna become a larger and larger issue for growers. Um, things like ticks, right? These are not just going, these are really going to impact farm workers so um, and, and farmers. So it's, it's pests and diseases and weeds um, that are going to affect both our crops and people working within agriculture. Um, so some of the impacts specifically to perennial fruit crops um, that we're seeing, right? As I just mentioned, greater pest impacts. Insects, weed diseases, these are just some impacts uh, like coddling moth damage, leaf roller damage, impacts we're gonna be seeing to potentially a greater extent within uh, perennial crop production. Um, this is an example just of white uh, per, 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 Procunia, I always pronounce that wrong scale. Um, you all know what I'm talking about most likely and things like fire blight. So these are gonna be more difficult to control. They're gonna become more of issues and more prevalent um, with greater precipitation, greater temperature that are gonna affect um, the, the uh, mating um, cycles of crops and the, and the or mating and generation of cycles of different uh, pests that will impact perennial crops in general. Um, weeds are gonna become more of an issue. Um, things where we have, and the, the two images on the right are actually, it was a drought in the summer followed by heavy precipitation really led to cracking in fruit. So impacts of both weeds and water, um, I'm just saying broadly. And that weeds, this is likely going to be leading to greater pesticide applications by growers. So right for a long time, we've been focusing, implementing IPM strategies to try and get growers to reduce their pesticide applications. And potentially with climate change, there's going to be a need for greater pesticide applications because of um, the change in, in cycles and um, prevalence of different pests within our production system. And so really what we've been focusing on with this assessment and, and those impacts, and I think many of you are well aware of those impacts and, and are studying those impacts in, in great detail, but what are some of the adaptation strategies that farmers are thinking about and are using? And so that's really been um, a key focus of this assessment currently. Um, things like hail netting, this is a really nice picture that Mike provided me. Um, up in the Champlain Valley. Um, and this can also help in some cases with pest um, control as well, um, in terms of a physical barrier. Um, investing in soil health, a lot more uh, perennial fruit growers are thinking about soil health. How can we improve soil health? This is obviously a great area of interest in myself, um, thinking about can we recycle organic wastes and utilize them through wood chips um, or other pre-plant application um, methods to perennial fruit crops. And this will this is a key adaptation strategy in terms of boosting potentially nutrient management, water management, and things like that. Wind machines, I think everyone's um, seeing these more and more on the landscape, not just in apples, but in grapes as well, um, to, to help mix the air, air and reduce um, potential frost damage impacts or the severity of those impacts. Um, another example here is um, a really innovative grower up in the Lake Ontario region, um, doing a lot with cover crops um, as pre-plant um, and building the health of his soil to help hopefully improve the resiliency of his trees to extreme weather events. Um, seeing more and more growers um, install tile drainage in orchards, which was something historically that, that hadn't been done in certain parts of the state, but it's a way to handle too much water, excess water. But at the same time on that other extreme, um, 
all new all new orchard plantings have irrigation essentially there's very few orchards around the state that don't have um irrigation anymore so we're handling both too much water and too little water at the same time some other adaptation strategies right that that growers are turning to or have been using for a long period of time right is ipm um putting out uh monitoring traps putting out mating disruption ties more and more growers are thinking about utilizing these um these practices. There are several decision support tools that are available to growers um, when it comes to thinking about the possibility for freeze damage um, in grapes and uh, or in apples and grapes as well. There's there's other ones too. Um, and there's cover crop um, decision support tools and things like that. So these are all resources to growers to help them um, adapt to the impacts of climate change. And the final example I'm just going to put out there is growers needing to invest in greater refriger refrigeration, as an example, um, or thinking about are we turning to alternative fruit crops? Um, and speaking with Greg, you mentioned some growers are thinking more and more about pawpaws, if that's feasible for them, and opportunities for new cultivars and rootstock. So one of the biggest things with climate change, right, and we've been finding through this report is actually the financial investment that's required by growers to adapt to climate change, to the impacts of climate change. So there's huge economic investment required to really be able um, to withstand what's going to be happening um, in our future warming and wetter world. Um, within the chapter, um, I just put this, I, and I'll, I'll provide these slides to everyone. This was just a summary of um, the impacts to perennial fruit crops and then potential adaptation strategies um, that are available or growers are thinking about. So on the left, things like warmer winters are an impact, pest invasions, and then on the right are some bullets that are really broad adaptation strategies that are available to growers. And, and obviously these are gonna vary farm to farm depending on where growers are within New York State and, and across the Northeast. Within this climate assessment, um, one of the important things has been trying to highlight or showcase the real world impacts um, that farmers are experiencing when it comes to climate change. So when the um, chapter is available to you all, there are two case studies um, talking about climate impacts and adaptation strategies that farmers are using um, when it comes to perennial fruit. Um, so one is a interview that Greg had done with Ted Ferber up in Wayne County on some of the, his in, the impacts and adaptations he's um, using on his farm related to uh, to climate change. And then the second perennial fruit one is with Suzanne Hunt um, in grape production in the Finger Lakes region as well. So those are really um, going to highlight what growers are seeing right now and, and things steps they are taking to withstand these climate extremes. Um, so that, that's the big picture. I know we're, we're keeping this brief and I think I'm right at 20 minutes. Um, so those are just some of the big picture impacts um, that we've seen and that will be published in this report. So hang on to that link, New York's NYS climate impacts dot um, org for the full publication that will be coming out in hopefully a few weeks. It was meant to be done at the end of 2023, but right now those climate projections that I just shared are available online if you go there. Um, and then the full publication will be available shortly. So thanks, Mike, um, for the time and looking forward to the discussion a bit later. All right. Thanks so much, Debbie. Uh, really informative presentation. Um, I do just want to take a, a couple of minutes since I think we've got time. Uh, if there's any initial questions for Debbie on what she just presented, by all means, feel free to unmute yourself and, and go ahead and ask. Yeah, I've got one. Um, that was great. Um, we're doing a, we just updated or in the process of updating our state climate assessment for agriculture in Maine. So I'd like to touch base with you about that because I wish I'd have known you guys were doing this. I could have grabbed some free stuff. But um, you mentioned coddling moth. Are you actually, have you actually documented any increase in coddling moth or is that just sort of a theoretical construct? 
Good question. Um, that I was just providing an example. Generally, um, it's we're seeing greater um, prevalence of pests and diseases in general. So pests being weeds, diseases, and insects. Um, that the these are just becoming more and more of an issue for growers across the state. So it's not specifically saying coddling moth. I was just putting that as an example for the slides. I'll just jump in too. We are yeah. going to have Ann Nielsen in about two weeks, Glenn. So she'll talk a little bit more and maybe she'll have a better answer for you on that. Um, anecdotally, I'm, I'm curious just what you all have seen over the you know couple of years. Um, of course, I've only been here six years, so I, I can't really give any long trends. Um, it does seem to me like we're, we're starting to see more fruit rots creeping up north just from conversations with my growers, but curious to see what, what you've seen. Have you seen similar, Glenn? Oh, that well, I guess my reaction to that is no, but I don't measure those things really. So my I don't I have negative anecdotal. But I, I wonder if the increase in honey crisps might be related to the fruit rot issue mm -hmm. too, because they tend to get more fruit rots. But um and just another comment about the winter free, you know, the frost and stuff. One thing we've discovered this year was growers really don't understand how to deal with frost. They, you know, like some used overhead irrigation, but they actually made it worse because they didn't have enough water to go through the, the whole night. So you actually make it worse if you start that and don't finish it. And then they bought wind machines. Yeah, they'll protect you against advective frost, but I mean, uh, yeah, advective, but a, a, the other frost, you know, a real freeze or the whole system moves in the wind ain't gonna help you, so it's make it worse. So, we, and the, the point is, we there's grower education around these things that we need to be thinking about. Yeah, definitely 100%. agree with that one. I couldn't agree more, Glenn, with what you're saying. And I will say, not necessarily with coddling moth, but I know through some um, IPM programs, at least in, in certain parts of the state, I know they have seen more generations of certain pests within their traps um, for scouting. Um, so I did want to just uh, correct myself on that one. I see Matt has a hand though. Yep, Matt, feel free, go ahead. All right, thank you for your presentation. It's really informative. Um, I was curious about um, the results of the tile drainage you'd mentioned uh, farmers weren't implementing. I've never heard of it. Are they having success? So once again, I I have I don't have direct data myself on that, um, and I haven't spoken with Greg about that. But I know this is something just more and more growers are installing tile drainage, potentially working with their soil and water conservation districts or NRCS um, to get funding to install tile drainage. Um, but I I don't know. Maybe Mike or Janet or Jason or others have comments on that. Yeah, I don't, I don't have a good percentage, but I would say, you know, most of the growers that I'm working with now, when they're putting in new blocks, they're, they're thinking of in, installing it. And if they're not, it's, it's just due to price limitations, but um, we definitely see the clear benefits of it. Looking at, especially this summer with the amount of rain we got up in my region, I think, um, you know, one grower had 14 inches in July. I mean, you know, the systems that wiped out Vermont, we got you know, the same day. Um, and you could just see the the pooling water in some of the orchards. I mean, I have a, a pickup truck with four wheel drive now and there were still puddles I wouldn't drive through. Um, so you could see where there wasn't drainage and, you know, probably would have helped in those situations. So um, definitely a, a good management practice that we strongly encourage. Yeah, that sounds really cool. I'm wondering um, if you knew about the conservation innovation grant from NRCS and whether or not you could get like uh, funding to implement that through that grant. So um, as far as I'm aware, conservation innovation grants are more research based grants. I mean, if I think if you wanted to do research on it, um, potentially, but often growers might be able to get funding through their soil and water conservation districts. Okay, thank you.
Yeah, yeah. But one thing I will say with these, um, the different practices that I mentioned is that it's all trade-offs, right, for the growers. So investing heavily in tile drainage in one year might be great, like Mike mentioned, when you receive 14 inches of, of rain. Um, but in another year where you have a drought, you end up having to irrigate, irrigate heavily. So growers are essentially having to invest in both adaptation strategies to handle both extremes. Um, and not all growers are able to do this from a financial aspect. So one of the big findings we have and um, coming out of the, the ag chapter is the need for greater financial support from, from um, organizations and from a policy side, at least within New York State. I'm not sure what Glenn and folks are saying within Maine and, and others across the Northeast, but that's certainly a key finding that we're having for agriculture. There needs to be te technical and financial support to be able to implement these practices. And Debbie, you might know more. I've heard um, talking with a couple of people at NRCS. I mean, it sounds like they've got just a, a ton of money right now. I've had conversations with people saying they're afraid they're not going to be able to spend it all. Um, so they're asking growers to submit project ideas left and right. I don't know if you heard that too, but that was sort of the impression that I got that there's just a, a lot of money out right now for, you know, things like this. Yeah, I, I think um, at least within New York State, the um, CRF, which is the Climate Resilient Farming Grants, um, the Soil and Water Conservation Districts um, present these annually to the Soil and Water Conservation Committee committee in New York State, and it's going to vary state by state, I think, but at least within New York State, there were millions of dollars, um, and I think about $11 million more in climate resilient farming funding for growers uh, across New York State than in previous years. Um, and there's several different tracks that you can apply for, for um, the CRF grants. Um, but if growers, if you know growers who are interested in implementing practices or having issues, when it comes to climate impacts, I would uh, encourage them to speak with their local soil and water conservation district and see what financial opportunities there are available to them to apply for. Okay, great. Glenn, I see you have your hand raised again. Yeah, and NRCS, I've heard that too. They got a ton of money and they also passed a bill. Um, they got money specifically to make money for available through technical service providers because they started that program about 10 years ago and I looked into it and the paperwork involved was just horrendous. Mm -hmm. And they got kind of slapped upside the head. They're like, you guys got to make it easier to work with you. So that's like a, a double advantage there, so. Okay, great, that's really good to know. I know I, I keep encouraging people to, to, to talk to those groups uh, if they want to make some of those adjustments to their to their land. Any other questions for Debbie before we move on to our next speaker? I think one more I have, Debbie, is, um, I mean, I think this year was sort of just a poster child of all the wacky things that could happen. I was really waiting for the the clouds of locusts to start showing up after uh, the spring that we had. I mean, do you feel like this is going to start becoming more of the norm, or do you think this year is still going to be hopefully just a one in 20 kind of scenario? That's a difficult question. <laughs> I, I think it, the reality is um, we're going to be seeing a lot greater variability moving forward. We're going to see more and more extremes. Um, and the intensity of these extremes is going to continue to be greater. So these one in 100 year events, these one in 50 year events are going to be more and more frequent. And I think all the observations and climate projections are showing that this is going to happen. Um, and so I think if growers are not currently thinking about implementing adaptation strategies and investing in them, it's probably in their best interest too, because I think all the data is pointing to things only getting worse, unfortunately. I like to be an optimist, but I'm also a realist when it comes to these things. Sure. Can I, can I share a quick uh, look at the plant hardiness zones we came up with for our main report? Sure. All right, here I go. Let me see if I can share the screen here. Da, 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 share screen. There we go. Which one is there? You seeing that? Yep. So it just 
well, well, I'll go up a little bit. I'll show you the main version. It puts numbers on it. I mean, this is radical. Um, mm -hmm. You know, my house used to get, you know, the old number was 25 below. And, you know, by 2050, it's 20 degrees warmer. Um, and here's the kind of the regional view that shows, you know, Maine turns into uh, southern New Jersey. Wow. And at a meeting last week, I was talking about this with one of the consultants, and he said, yeah, he's hearing from growers in New Jersey that can't grow peaches anymore. And I said, what do you mean? They're still a lot cooler than Georgia and South Carolina. He said, no, it's not that. He says their, their, their seasons are advancing, but their winter frost is not moving late as fast as it needs to, or moving earlier, sorry. So they're getting whacked by spring frost. So mm -hmm. this, this whole mess up of, you know, relative dates for things, it's not just this gradual, we turn into New Jersey, it's, it's a mess. So anyway, thanks for letting me share that. So. Yeah, that's an excellent point, Glenn. And I think that's actually a, a really great segue into our next speaker. Um, I know Jason's looking quite a, a lot at the shifting hardiness of trees throughout the winter. And he's going to be telling us about some of the ways that we can mitigate against some of that. So um, I think hmm. with that, Jason, um, how are we going to, how are we going to get through this? <laughs> yeah. And I don't have a silver bullet either. So um, I'm going to give you the, the lay of the land though. Let's see if we get this in the right. Are you seeing presenter view or are you seeing the good view? I'm seeing presenter at the moment. Okay, hold on one second. I always have to switch these. How's that better? Yep, looks good now. We're good now. Okay, yeah. Um, thanks, Mike. So, um, I I guess I can go right off that last one. It's climate chaos, right? The the new norm is abnormal, and that's unfortunately what's going to continue to happen until we stop pumping heat into the atmosphere. It's just going to keep getting worse and more irregular. Um, so what do we do to fix that? And there's not a whole lot you can do in any one year, and you can't do a whole lot with perennials because of the investment over time, but we can make some wise decisions going forward to hopefully reduce the amount of um, pain in the process. And so what I can share with you today is some of the research I'm doing on apple cold hardiness and how I think it might be related to some of our tree decline issues. Um, and we'll go from there. I've got a little bit of mitigation at the end, but uh, yeah, you'll see there's there's less that I could do there than I'd like. Um, so just a, to put a foundation on it, what we're talking about with cold hardiness in this particular case is, is winter cold hardiness. I'm not really talking about frost. And here I'm talking mostly about stem tissues, but you can make the same assumptions around buds as the data I'm showing you with stems. Uh, the cold hardiness is the ability to resist freezing temperatures during winter. And it's typically uh, in the shape of this U-shaped U-shaped curve here, minus some of these, there we go, U-shaped curve, uh, where you have the gaining of cold hardiness in the beginning of winter, during an acclimation phase, a maintenance phase in the middle of winter, and then the loss of cold hardiness in the spring, which is called deacclimation. And we're not going to get into dormancy today, but it's important to know that in addition to winter minimum temperatures, there's another physiological event and transition going on in the background, and that's this move from endodormancy, which is a very heat resistant type of dormancy uh, that occurs in early winter. During winter, that transitions to eco dormancy, which is a very heat sensitive type of dormancy, correlates with the deacclimation part of this curve. And the movement between those two types of dormancy occurs based on the amount of chilling that we get. And so that's the amount of exposure to temperatures between roughly zero and 10 Celsius uh, throughout the winter. So as winters get more mild, it's but there's the potential that this chilling accumulation happens faster and this transition occurs earlier and earlier in the winter. So that has a big impact on when our cold causes damage in any given year. When we think about apples, there's uh, this other aspect that's going on in that they're grafted. And so we actually have two genetic individuals experiencing winter together. And it's possible that the rootstock and the science. So there's only a little bit of the rootstock that's above ground, but the piece that's above ground is navigating winter on its own timetable relative to the scion. And it's possible that the curves of these two different genotypes don't always work uh, together very well. And that's exacerbated by uh, climate variation, in particular with snow cover. And, uh, 
we've been measuring the differences of temperature between snow, uh, snow covered uh, trees and exposed trees. And it's a lot warmer underneath the snow. I think we all know this. And as a result, you have these two parts of the trees experiencing two very different winters and they have they're going to have very different freeze dynamics based on if there's snow or if there is not or if there is a lot of snow when that snow may or may not melt and in this particular case as i'm showing here if we have a lot of snow cover that rootstock shank could be uh experiencing a winter that's much more like a very mild winter in virginia and that has the potential to change the shape of the cold hardiness curve and put that tissue at uh, risk of freeze damage if we have a big warm up and then a sudden plunge in temperature. And so then we want to ask the question how does the cold damage affect production? And this is where the interface uh, comes into play with tree decline, in that uh, tree decline is very complex. I'm not trying to say that cold damage explains all tree decline, uh, but we're starting to see um, some growers with concern and some, some field observations of. Uh, the potential for cold damage interacting with the concept of tree decline. And we want to know specifically whether or not cold has the ability to, to create uh, the conditions that lead to eventual tree decline. Um, just to, to quickly frame what we're seeing, we're seeing young trees and, and older trees that are showing differences in the cyan leaf pattern. I'm showing here uh, some excess anthocyanins and gala, some exaggerated chlorosis and honey crisp. When we cut into some of these trees that are showing foliar symptoms, we see this pattern of necrosis in the um, the outer bark tissue here. This is the phloem and the cambium. Those are the those are the tissues responsible for sugar transport to the roots. Uh, you can see that above the necrosis, you've got healthy tissue, and the root itself is alive. The cyan is alive. The graft union looks okay, but we're seeing this weird ring of damage. In older trees, this damage is more exaggerated, and I'll show an example of that in a minute. And what we see with that exaggerated damage is a potentially secondary infection with um, fungi, slugs, uh, different borers. And so this is where it plays into the IPM and climate change in that whether or not uh, cold damage and increased pest pressure is leading to these, this decline together. Uh, the roots are healthy. Suckers are common. Uh, suckers mean that the scion isn't supplying the root with what it needs. And so that's a good indication that you've got some girdling going on. Uh, the rootstocks vary, lots of M9 uh, in our observations, but it's also M9 is planted over the widest area. So it could be observation bias. And so we're working on trying to characterize this a little bit more. Uh, this is just an example of some of the really bad uh, rootstock damage. Um, so here you can see I've pulled away this, this flaking bark and underneath you can see that the core of the tree is intact but the phloem and the xylem is completely uh, destroyed. This little image shows you that as you go around the tree, you can see that this tree is currently being supported by this little strip of phloem that's that's maintaining this connection. And that's just not enough uh, of a security blanket for that tree to, to go through years and years of stress. And so the big question remains is, is this kind of damage related to cold damage? And so first we need to establish whether or not cold damage and cold resistance, if there's any variation between different rootstocks or between rootstocks and scions, that might explain why we see this damage popping up. And so we do some uh, phenotyping in my group. We started with oxidative browning, and the easiest way to describe this is you take a bunch of stem tissue from rootstocks or scions, you chop it up, you freeze it at different temperatures, and then you take a look at it after a couple of days at room temperature, and the amount of browning uh, can be correlated with um, tree death. And so here the idea is that that uh, the freeze damaged tissue leaks out their uh, innards and that inner mess uh, oxidates, turns brown, and then you can use that as a phenotypic scale. And this works really great until you start to look at a bunch of different rootstocks and you see that there's so much variation in simply whether or not something browns at all. Uh, whether or not it has a red leaf uh, phenotype, which gives you this, this purple uh, cross section. You can't really tell the browning here. Um, you have differences in phloem and cambium damage versus xylem damage. And so this method is um, works for good, quick and dirty, but I'm not really happy with uh, the level of variation we have just in whether or not something browns. And so we use another method called electrolyte leakage. And this is the same concept 
cut the stems up, put them at different freeze temperatures, and then measure how much of the cellular gunk leaks into the solution. And the idea is the more that these segments leak into solution, the more damage there is in that tissue. And so we take a freeze value, uh, electrolyte leakage value after our freeze treatment, and then we freeze them all in a negative 70 freezer just to really make sure we kill them and measure them again. And then you get a relative damage measurement. So that data looks similar to this. So as, as you go from zero degrees down to negative 60 degrees Celsius, you increase your damage through time. And, and so the farther the dots are up on this y-axis, the more leakage that those um, stem segments produced. And you can plot a dose response curve through this to try to get a relative comparison of cold hardiness throughout the winter. And so here in the colors, November, December, January, and February, you can see how that cold hardiness curve is shifting. November started out here, blue, it shifted down to uh, cyan and then back up to brown and then eventually to gray. And we see that um, if we look at a correlation between the oxidative browning damage and this electrolyte leakage damage, we have two points of comparison. Here at the inflection point, the LT50 is sort of the complete kill point. So this is where xylem damage is very evident. And around the LT25 is where you see a little bit more variation in cambium and phloem damage. And I'll remind you in the treatocline situation, we're seeing damage in that phloem and cambium. So we're really, we're looking at uh, the damage values that are around this LT25. Okay, so now let's talk about how winters are changing and how this affects the cold hardiness. So this is uh, 2021, 2022. This is a quote unquote normal winter, although over the last 12 years that I've lived here, this is a really mild winter in general, but it has that nice U-shaped curve to what we expect our winters to look like, where we have a consistent cold in late winter. When we look at the cold hardiness curves of the different rootstocks in my study, so here I've got B9, I've got M9 and Ottawa 3 as controls, and then I'm working on a lot of the Geneva series rootstocks to see if we have any um, really good rootstocks or any real stinkers. In the solid line is the LT25. So again, that's the cambium and phloem damage. In the dashed line is the xylem. Um, and what you can see in the cold year is that we have beautiful U-shaped curves for all of these varieties. In general, the G series are more cold hardy than B9 or B or M9. You can see that they reach colder values in midwinter. But all of these trees uh acclimated to winter very well. That's this portion here. You see how they gain cold hardiness and they deacclimate as expected in late winter. There's really not much of a story here, except for there's a slight difference in cold hardiness between uh, sort of our standards and the G series in a cold year. Now let's compare it to last winter, which I think we all, well, hopefully everybody remembers. I work in winter all year, so I always remember the winters. It was a bit different winter to be sure. So if you overlay the temperature on the same dates, you see that it was a little cooler in mid-October and then got warmer in November. And then the big change between the years is right here between Christmas and early February. So we had the Christmas plunge and then it got very, very warm in early January and then stayed near the freezing point before freezing very hard again in February and then a normal exit. So the big difference here is that it was warm in midwinter versus cold in midwinter. When we look at the shapes of the cold hardiness curves here, now they don't have that nice U shape anymore. Um, it was a really messy year uh, from a cold hardiness point of view. And what you can see is that you have, you have less of the U and you have much more of this W. And that W happens right around this heating event that we had in midwinter. You can see depending on which variety. And it, what it has, the impact of that heat on the um, cold hardiness phenotype is that all of these little black circles show you the situation where the um, rootstock cold hardiness decreased to a point where it intersected with our minimum temperatures. And so we would have expected there was potential for some phloem and cambium damage in all of these rootstocks uh, last winter. You can see that the the biggest driver of that is this early season deacclimation. So whereas in the past, we looked at the deacclimation in late winter, in response to this heat spike, we saw this uh, unseasonable uh, deacclimation and that put a lot of these different varieties at risk. 
And so the, uh, let's see, if you overlap the two years, you can see the really big effect of the difference between a mild year and a cold year. You can see that the early part of winter, the acclimation phase in most of these genotypes was the same. They took the fall cues of temperature the same, gained the same amount of cold hardiness, but then that difference between a cold midwinter versus a mild midwinter really gummed the situation up and put a lot of these cultivars at risk or genotypes at risk. Okay, what's going on this year um, is we see that the scale actually had to shift a little bit on the y-axis because our uh, September and October were so hot this year. So they started out hot, but then they started this uh, late fall, early winter uh, change in temperature. It was pretty normal between the, uh, the three different years. The big difference here is we look a little bit more like the hot, mild winter when we start. And now, of course, we're somewhere in the middle here in this current cold snap. And so it's interesting. It has components of both uh, the cold year and the warm year. And when we look at what this year's cold hardness uh, is looking like, we see that reflected in the different genotypes. And so again, here in the blue lines, this is this winter's acclimation profile. You can see again, the early part of gaining cold hardiness in all of these varieties is very consistent across years. The big difference is, is now we're starting to see a little bit of separation in midwinter between varieties like B9, G11, G214, 935 and M9, you see how this blue point, instead of continuing down into the U-shape of the cold hardiness curve, it's starting to deacclimate. Now we don't have quite the heat up that we did last year, but we're still quite mild leading up. Of course, this week is a little bit colder. Um, so the question is whether or not this deacclimation uh, sets the cold hardiness in as a flat line, or if these can gain a little bit of cold hardiness for late winter. Uh, this is just another way of looking at the same data and to show you that there are certain um, rootstocks that are performing better than others. And so I've boxed them here in blue. Uh, these six varieties had good cold hardiness in uh, both years. And again, this is the LT25. So this is the temperature it would take to cause some uh, cambial damage. As a reminder, here's when the cold snap happened last year on February 4th. And all of these varieties had deacclimated. Uh, to the point where they were at risk of taking cold damage. And so this is this is something we're watching now going forward in the current year. It depends on what we're going to have the rest of this winter, whether or not we replicate the cold year or we replicate the warm year. Picture down below here is the deacclimation that occurred in the field. And so just to explain that, what we do in this top set here is we took the cold hardiness in January and subtracted it from December. And that gives you the change in cold hardiness between those two points, the deacclimation. In this case, B9 lost 4.6 degrees Celsius of cold hardiness between December and January. And that amounts to a lot of 15% reduction in its cold hardiness. And in contrast, this uh, 2034, it acclimated negative 10 degrees and it gained 44% of its cold hardiness. And the, the numbers you see at the bottom of the, the slide here is simply the February versus January. When you put these two together, you can get a sense for whether or not these varieties have good deacclimation resistance. And again, the ones that I boxed in blue did a pretty good job. You can see here with these first two, they gain cold hardiness at both of these time points. Whereas for example, B9 deacclimate, oops, I'm sorry about that. Where B9 deacclimate, deacclimated at both um, time points. And so using this information, we can start to build the database of rootstocks that are good generalists. They do good in mild years, they do good in cold years versus ones that are really more suited for areas that maintain a deep midwinter cold. Now I don't, I am doing scion work at the same time. The scion story is a lot less interesting. Um, we don't, we already know which varieties do well in which regions um, through past field studies. And when we look at the cold hardiness values of the science, it's actually kind of a boring story overall in that the curves are very, very flat. Almost all of the varieties that are in my uh, experiment have the same response. They all have this very, very flat cold hardiness response uh, in both years. 
And so in general, they're much less reactive than the rootstocks. Uh, this is just showing you G41's curve. They're less reactive and less cold hardy than the rootstocks in general. And how am I doing here? I'm right at 20, so I'm going to skip past this slide because it's not that important. No! Just... <laughs> Did you add that one? Yeah. Okay, no okay, okay, okay. <laughs> sorry, all right, sorry. I just don't want to take any Jessica's time. So, uh, okay, so what I showed you here is that the that the curves are basically a lot f flatter, but not as deep as the rootstock. And so what I showed in the very beginning was that these two different genotypes in these grafted trees could be experiencing winter very differently. And what this is showing is that in fact, their response uh, demonstrates that there's the potential for a real desynchrony between those two different parts. This is just a relative ranking of the cold hardiness in each month. This is for last winter because I have the most complete data for last winter, and I'll update this with the current winter once we have it all the way. When you start in the beginning of the winter, you can see in rootstocks here in gray that rootstocks tend to be the least cold hardy out of the comparisons with um, fresh fruit scions and cider scions being more cold hardy, mold, ugh, excuse me, more cold hardy, or a few of these, these uh, the cider varieties started out a little less cold hardy uh, compared with the fresh varieties. But as we move through the winter, we see that the relative position between these different types of genetics are changing. So by midwinter now, most of the rootstocks are much more cold hardy than the uh, scions. They shuffle around a little bit in the middle of winter. And again, this is because of some of the rootstocks deacclimating in response to that hot uh, midwinter. But by the time we get to the end of winter, we see here in April, we have uh, basically rebuilt what we saw in November. Now all the rootstocks are the weakest from a cold hardiness point of view relative to the scions. And so if you remember from that first figure, the shape of that U, what you're seeing here is that the U is deeper and sharper for rootstocks than it is for scions. And so depending on the winter conditions that you have and whether or not you have snow cover, you have the potential to disrupt these relationships between these different uh, partners. So I only have one little slide on mitigation, and that is because all of this is being driven by the climate, and it's very hard. You can't really change the way that the climate is being experienced in midwinter. Um, the best way to mitigate against climate chaos is to pick good sites. You want sites that have good microclimate buffers, like along the lakes, or good air drainage, so you don't get pockets of um, extreme cold temperatures. And you want to pick the cultivars uh, with a lot of knowledge. And, and I recognize that the knowledge generation for winter hardiness and responses to temperature um, is a, a gap in our understanding. And it takes me several years before I have any confidence to tell you whether or not something is a for sure good choice or bad choice, but we are working on it. If you choose to have diversity of rootstocks and diversity of science, in production, that's going to give you the biggest buffer against any one climate uh, erratic event. Um, from a management point of view, and for midwinter uh, hardiness, I think the biggest thing is don't over fertilize the trees, particularly in the fall. Anything that keeps the trees actively growing is competing directly with the natural process of shutting down uh, to achieve dormancy and to gain cold hardiness. And this is particularly um, problematic, I'm assuming, for nurseries because you want to push growth and you're going to push them as far into the season as possible and i think that could really be setting things up for late late fall early winter cold snaps you also don't want to prune when the forecast suggests really large swings in temperature because you're opening up wounds uh in the the vascular tissue and those wounds can be a site for ice nucleation if you prune and there's plenty of healing time, those uh, damaged cells are going to be walled off and you're going to have much less chance of ice propagating from the prune into the rest of the tree. And of course, painting trunks white can help reduce southwest injury. And that's just by reducing the amount of heat that the tree is absorbing from the sun. And that heat works both on freeze-thaw dynamics and also on that deacclimation 
that I showed the the heat coming from the sun can add five to seven degrees to air temperature. And that can really mean the difference between maintaining cold hardiness or losing it. And the last thing, the hope for the future is chemistry. Can we, can we somehow modify tree behavior through chemistry? And so we talked a little bit about frost mitigation and really the, the only possible thing out there is using promalin. And that's only if frost hits at flower and kills your ovaries that you can get something of a fruit to form despite the lack of seeds. Uh, but that there is no chemical option that I'm aware of that will repair uh, peel damage like you're seeing here on the right. Once the, the frost damages the peel, there's really uh, nothing that we know of that can repair that apart from that russet, which is the, the nature's Band-Aid. There is some research looking into nanoparticle and foam-based protectants. And the idea here is to slow the rate of cooling in these uh, acute uh, cold events. Um, but when we have really deep freezes, it may not be enough to just slow the cooling down if the, the minimum temperature is low enough. And one area that I am totally firing from the hip on is I've been reading papers about how trees repair themselves after being girdled. And it seems that there's a, a really important interaction between gibberellins and auxin that initiates cambial growth and tree repair. And so I'm really curious to try this. Uh, and I will be doing this in the future, seeing if we can use some of our um, PGRs that are used during the rest of the growing season for other uses to see if we can stimulate wound repair uh, in following freeze events. And so, like I said, I'm shooting from the hip there, but I, I have a suspicion that that might be a pretty cool approach uh, to giving farmers a tool after these acute cold events. And so just to conclude, in a cold year, there is variation between rootstocks, but in general, the rootstocks that I've tested, all, all 22 of them, are totally sufficient to survive winter without damage. The scions are generally less responsive to winter, winter temperature changes um, with the, the caveat of the cultivars that we know that are weak to winter, such in Golden Delicious and John Gold, were also, cold, were also cold sensitive in my studies. So there are bad scions, depending on where you're growing, uh, but they tend to be much less responsive to these erratic temperatures. In a mild year, uh, there's definitely a difference between safe and risky rootstocks. And we'll just have to do a couple more years of studies to know whether or not some of these, like I've noted here, G11, um, B9 and M9, G484, 814, whether or not these are really risky in all years and they should be avoided going forward, or if um, we have to get a little bit more uh, correlation with our exact winter conditions. So cold hardness traits are one of the traits that need to be considered. And that trait may rise in importance relative to others like uh, suckers, bitter pit control, uh, vigor control. It's just gonna depend on what the winters ahead look like, whether or not cold hardiness rises to be one of the, the traits that people need to pick in their top three traits. So with that, I just wanted to thank, this is the crew of people who have helping with all this work. Um, and I'll just wrap up there quick. Uh, take any questions if, if anyone's got any. All right, thank you very much, Jason. Uh, we did have a question come in the chat box from Michelle. Uh, have you published this information? And if so, where, where can she find it? <laughs> no, we're still, um, I can give you the information. I'm happy to share it. Uh, we will be publishing, we'll probably put a publication out after this winter because then we'll have three years of data. What you can see, hopefully, from what I'm showing you is that, um, Publishing, I, I did put out a, um, I'll backtrack a little bit. I did put out a fruit quarterly on the first year of data. And then after I saw the second year of data and I saw how much impact a mild winter can have, I've decided to be a little bit more conservative. I don't want to, I don't want to give people bad data. I want to really do a good job of um, creating the bins of safe and, and risky uh, root stocks before getting out there. But I'm happy to share it with anybody um, and talk with them. Uh, just so that you have the most up-to-date information. We have another question from Glenn. Do you want to just, just say it out loud, Glenn? Yeah, so I asked Gennaro Fazio this question last week, and he deferred me to you, so here we are. <laughs> um, he showed some of your slides. He didn't really get into it. He was just flashing by them. But, so if you prune midwinter, 
how much does that increase your sensitivity on that, you know, freeze sensitivity curve for the scions? And I looks like I'm, I'm I guess kind of looked to me like about 10 degrees Celsius, but that was just a kind of a wing and a prayer estimate. And then how long does that effect last before it kind of goes back to where it should have been if you hadn't pruned? Yeah, that is a great question. And I don't really have a good answer for you. One of the issues is that when you're doing pruning, you're pruning big trees, right? And so if you see freeze damage, you're seeing it like um, to the base of the prune and into the trunk. And the material I'm using is all young first year tissue. And so we're not we're not evaluating what that prune is doing to the stuff that we're pulling off, right? We're not giving it, it's not an adequate comparison. The, from what I understand from the pruning damage that's occurring, that makes most sense from a um, that wound ice nucleation in that what you're doing it is you're taking an intact system that is able to handle ice formation and control ice crystal growth. And you're introducing a site where that ice is no longer regulated. Right. And so that's, that's what that damage wave, what's driving that damage wave is that you've perturbed this, the ability for it to suppress the freezing. So I don't know how long it's going to take. It's going to depend on how much time you have to heal between the freeze event. So if you prune when everything's frozen, I think it's much less likely to cause a problem with existing freeze. If you prune when things are really warm and then there's going to be a strong freeze after that, you're not that liquid water in the uh at the surface of that prune is going to serve as a prime. So I can't really answer you. It's really is really what I can say. Um and in part because the tissue that we're comparing isn't necessarily comparable. Okay. And sorry then, for that. And look at your cultivar ratings, how they shift through the winter. Mm -hmm. Does that mean that our sort of standard hardiness zone ratings for these different cultivars are really kind of noisy because it depends on which month of the year you took that estimate. It's like fire blight sensitivity ratings. I've been told that those cultivar ratings are kind of meaningless because it just depends which cultivar happened to be blooming during the infection event. So mm -hmm. it's very noisy. Was that true of the hardiness ratings for cultivars? Yeah, I think looking at the scions, they, they all have much more of a very equivalent cold hardness. They have that really sort of um, shallow U shape. Um, you're, you're exactly right that when you get the cold is the important cold. And when you look at a hardiness comparison, particularly the hardiness maps, you're using the average minimum of, of a 20 year data set. That is not going to be a good predictor given the way that we're experiencing cold, particularly with polar vortexes. And so you can use it as a general guide in that we can say that golden delicious, for example, does not have the same freeze resistance as something like Honeycrisp. But saying that uh, the difference between some of the more cold hardy ones, that they're, that those can be projected by a, as something as a, uh, a gross descriptor as the hardiness map, I think, yeah, that is problematic. It's the best that we have right now because most of the studies don't do multi-month type of measurements to sort of see the, the dynamics change. And so we've been operating more on a low resolution sort of data. And hopefully this, hopefully this will help resolve some of those. If you remember back to um, the freeze hardiness uh, predictor that um, Debbie showed, the cold hardiness freeze prediction for Apple on that graph was negative 25 for the entire year. Like it didn't fluctuate. And that's simply because they assume that it's below that and there's no, no changing. But we're seeing it actually does change quite a bit depending on the conditions. All right. Thank you, Jason. Thanks. Glenn, just as a follow-up to your question, um, I, I did put it in an article uh, that Rich Marini wrote on pruning and its effects on cold hardiness. It doesn't quite give you that exact temperature range. He does say that it will re-harden off after about a two-week period, but I, I do recommend checking that out too. Um, so I think just in the time for interest, we're going to shift over now. Now that we've been thinking about the freezing cold, we're going to talk about the hot summer heat. So we're going to hear from Jessica Waite out of the USDA in Wenatchee. All right, return to summer. Okay, share. Hold on. Okay. 
Looks good from where I'm sitting. Great. Awesome. All right. Um, so I'm I'm Jessica. I'm a research geneticist at USDA ARS in Wenatchee in Washington. Um, I currently work uh, mostly on pears, pear rootstocks, um, but in my previous position, I worked as a postdoc in Lee Cowsett's lab um, at WSU, which is just right across the parking lot. Um, on understanding uh, molecular and physiological pathways that lead to apple sunburn. Um, and I still work a little bit on this topic. Um, I'm co-mentoring a student who is going to follow up with some of this work. Um, so today I'm gonna share with you kind of an overview of apple sunburn, uh, how it occurs, um, how we work to mitigate it in Washington um, and how we might use genetics and molecular biology to inform some of these mitigation strategies. Um, so before I start, I just wanna acknowledge, I'm gonna be sharing the work of uh, a lot of folks here. Um, a lot of this work is being done in uh, by different people in Lee Cowsett's group. Um, I have some folks in my group that are working on a lot more of the um, bioinformatics and molecular side. Um, Lauren Honus and Claude DePampolis' groups have helped with bioinformatics as well. Um, and then Kate Evans and, and Soon Lee Tay, um, we're using an Apple population that they um, that is from their program. Oh, does this not let me click through the next one? There we go. Um, so just outline, um, I'm going to first talk about apple sunburn, how it happens, um, then talk about current mitigation, um, and then talk about um, genetics and, and molecular biology. Um, so what conditions lead to apple sunburn in, in our area? Um, apple growing regions in Washington are, uh, they experience really intense, now let me change back to my, take off the laser pointer so I can click, um, experience really high levels of heat, light, um, and we don't have a lot of water. So this is um, a rain map here. So we're, we have kind of the opposite problem sometimes. Um, most growing regions are near rivers, so we haven't had too much of a problem yet. Um, but the combination of these uh, these environmental factors definitely give us um, a lot more sunburn stress. Um, so apples experience air temperature um, and light in such a way that it heats the surface of the fruit between 10 to 15 degrees Celsius above the air temperature. Um, so the fruit surface temperature, I'm gonna use this FST a lot throughout the, the talk. Um, uh, years ago, uh, Larry Schrader developed a model for predicting what the fruit, fruit surface temperature would be given the air temperature and humidity and wind and clouds. Um, and so this is um, a graph from 2018 of predicted uh, fruit surface temperature. Um, and I've marked um, the sort of at sunburn threshold in orange um, and below and above. Um, and you can see throughout that summer, we got a lot of temperatures that were had the potential to be above that, that sunburn threshold of fruit surface temperature. Uh, so uh, the work that I'm gonna talk about today is um, really focusing on that uh, on pre-harvest physiological damage to the skin caused by heat. Um, so a lot of the visible markings that can cause apples to be cold before going into storage or to market. Um, so there's also a lot of post-harvest effects. Um, sun scald can sometimes not be visible at the time of harvest and develop a lot more uh, during post-harvest. And there's a lot of other groups that are working on, on those post-harvest um, parts of, of sun damage. Um, but today I'm focusing on sort of what's visible at the time of harvest. Um, so there's been three main categories described, um, uh, again, by Larry Schrader some time ago. Um, sunburn necrosis on the top here. So this requires um, very high heat, um, somewhere around 52 C, um, and doesn't require light. This is just a, you got too hot, cells just start breaking down. Um, sunburn browning is what causes most of, of the damage that leads to apples being cold at this point. 
Um, and this is a higher heat, um, but below, so around 45, 46 C um, up to the point of, of necrosis. And this does require light. Um, and then uh, photooxidative sunburn, which is really a light shock. So this is happening when, when fruit that is shaded gets turned, for example. Um, and just so you can see how this um, is mapped out on this graph with light on the um, y-axis and temperature on the x-axis. Um, so photooxidative really doesn't need that high temperature to occur. It's, it's much more light-based, light um, whereas um, necrosis doesn't require light, but requires temperature. Um, in sunburn necrosis, you're getting a lot of tissue death and loss of cell membrane in, uh, integrity. Um, sunburn browning, you don't get so much of this, but you do get a lot of dis discoloration. Um, and then photooxidative sunburn, um, what we knew up to this point is um, bleaching um, and a lot of uh, reactive oxygen species um, production. So there's going to be a lot of uh, antioxidant activity in there as well. Uh, so what compl complicates this um, prediction of fruit surface temperature additionally is that cultivars respond differently to the same temperatures. Um, so uh, Brenda Castaneda, who's an undergrad in Lee's lab, um, and Sumaya Laliula, who was a postdoc previously, um, they started mapping out fruit surface temperature and air temperature and light every day of the season in 2018 um, to look at how, how that changed um, and how different cultivars responded. Um, so I'm just going to zoom in on Granny Smith for now to, to explain the graph a little bit better. Um, so on the bottom left-hand axis, you have um, photosynthetically active radiation, so light levels. Um, on the right-hand bottom axis, uh, we have air temperature. And then on the y-axis, we have the fruit surface temperature. Um, so you can see here at the very back of this uh, sheet that has been added to, to visualize um, this is for very high light, very high temperature. Um, you're getting fruit surface temperatures that are around 40 C, uh, low 40s. Uh, but when we look and compare Honeycrisp to Granny Smith, um, for the, the axes are the same here. Um, so for those same high light, high uh, temperature conditions, um, you're actually getting temperature, fruit surface temperatures that are more in the 45 and above region. Um, so for you can see for the same uh, conditions, Honeycrisp has much higher fruit surface temperature, uh, which would suggest that it might be more susceptible to sunburn. Uh, so for me, uh, as a molecular biologist, uh, this brings up a lot of questions about what's happening at the cellular level and at the molecular level um, when sunburn develops and why it's different for different cultivars, um, which I'll, I'll talk about a little bit more at the end. Um, but it also, uh, sorry, uh, but it's also important for sharing or for shaping how growers and researchers use uh, mitigation methods. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what we do, what we've been using in Washington mostly. Um, so there's really three big methods um, that, that folks have been using: um, protectant sprays, which essentially act as uh, sunburn or sorry, sunscreen, um, evaporative cooling, um, water-based water cooling techniques, um, and overhead netting. And then as uh, technology and tools have improved, we've now been able to, um, are starting to be able to add more genetics and molecular biology findings um, with things like transcriptomics and, and marker-assisted breeding um, to inform some of these uh, mitigation strategies. So I'm going to talk a little bit about each one and then talk about how we can kind of integrate the, the genetics and molecular biology. Uh, yeah, so protectant sprays. Um, we have a couple different categories that, that folks use. Um, particle films are one, one way. Um, the biggest one I know of being used is surround, which is uh, based uh, made up of kale and clay particles. Um, and this coats the fruit and acts to physically reflect the fruit, the light off of the fruit surface. Um, there are also chemical protectants. Um, one of these that I, I know is used is called Radox. Um, it's wax-based and also the, the chemical components within that wax act to absorb UV rays. Um, so few of them reach the, the fruit surface. 
So this really is very much like a uh, human sunscreen. <laughs> so mineral versus chemical sunscreen. Uh, both of these lower fruit surface temperature um, to about the same degree, um, but uh, less than other methods. Um, one drawback uh, I've heard people talk about is that particle films can be a little bit harder to wash off, um, but both of these are among the more affordable options. Uh, so evaporative cooling, um, this is a form of water-based cooling. Um, so using overhead sprinklers, water is applied to fruit and leaves. And then uh, once those sprinklers are turned off, the evaporation of that water has a cooling effect. Um, so to demonstrate this, this is a uh, figure from a review from Lee's lab, um, which is a really useful review. I definitely recommend uh, taking a look at it. Um, so what I'm showing you here, these are infrared images of a sun exposed apple um, before any evaporative cooling is ever turned on. Um, the middle panel is when the sprinklers are actively turned on. Um, and then the third panel is uh, a few minutes after they've been turned off and the evaporation effect is happening. Um, and the top sides of the fruit, the, the A1, B1, C1, are where the water is actually going to be hitting. Um, and the A2, B2, C2 is on the lower side of the apple where um, water is not actually touching the apple. Um, so you can see on that top side of the fruit, um, the water cools the fruit surface temperature uh, drastically. And then once the evaporation happens, it, it keeps going down, it stays low. Um, whereas where water was not touching, um, you can see the whole the whole orchard gets kind of cooled when the water's on, um, but that lower side uh, goes back up, not to the same extent, um, but it really, you can see the effect of the evaporation here. Um, this can be really effective, um, but definitely considering uh, water usage and availability is important. Um, overuse in some soils can lead to anaerobic soils. Um, so things to, to keep in mind when choosing, thinking about this method. Um, and then netting is um, something that a lot of um, growers are starting to uh, adopt. So these nets were originally developed for hail protection um, and they're, then they started being used as uh, sunburn protection. Um, so Things to consider are the color of the netting, um, the design, whether it's overhead or retractable or draped, um, and shade percentage. Um, after a lot of research, um, Lee's group has done um, quite a bit of research with, with netting. Um, the current industry standard is 20% shading um, and white color and then over the top. Um, this seems to be the most effective method, but it is definitely the most expensive because you have to build in all of the, the infrastructure to hold them up. Um, and in the beginning, they definitely saw trade-offs between uh, sunburn protection and red color development for the more red and bicolor apples. Um, but recent work um, has shown that if you have retractable netting and you retract the netting about 10 days before, um, harvest, you can get back a lot of that red color um, and not add more sunburn. Um, so that that is positive. Um, and uh, in terms of how these adapt or how these relate to one another, um, Lee's group uh, uh, in this review uh, put together these figures, um, pulling data from papers where they have actually compared all of these methods for different cultivars. Um, and you can see uh, the big takeaway here, so this is for Honeycrisp, and I'll show you Gala in a second, um, is that um, the sprays, the protectant sprays lower temperature the, the least, um, and netting lowers the most, um, but they all, they all are effective in lowering fruit surface temperature. Um, and then we can see for Gala that the, the uh, extent to which these are lowered is also uh, larger. So it seems to be uh, between cultivars, there's probably uh, um, some differences in how much each strategy can lower temperature. All right, so uh, just to switch gears a little bit um, and talk about how, how genetics and molecular biology might inform these methods. Um, 
Understanding molecular and physiological pathways um, can tell us a lot about how and why these mitigation techniques work and what's going on in the plant for each one. Um, and it can um, let us know whether we can change the way we use these methods to work with the, the plant's natural um, acclimation and, and stress defense systems. Um, so just an example of this, a project that I worked on um, was asking whether apples can acquire uh, thermotolerance um, or acclimation to temperature. And this is something that has been shown in other plant species um, where you uh, stress the plant with a, a high but sublethal stress. Um, so in this case, we would be, we treated the fruit with um, below sunburn threshold temperatures, um, but still above ambient temperature. Um, and then uh, wait some period of time. Uh, for our experiment, this is four weeks. Um, and then challenge them again um, with a range of different temperatures. Um, and for work in other plants has shown that this priming stimulus, this heat priming, um, can the plant will remember that and then um, be able to uh, withstand higher temperatures later on. Um, so this is this is how we set up this experiment. And then we, after this last stimulus, we um, collected and measured a lot of different variables after 72 hours, which is about the length of time it takes the sunburn to uh, develop after a heat stimulus. Um, and we did this, we used um, thermocouples to monitor the, the temperature of the fruit during the, the heat stress periods. Um, and essentially plastic bags just to, to use as kind of a mini greenhouse uh, environment. And so we would just open and close the plastic bags to make sure that they stayed at the temperatures that we were um, uh, giving them. Uh, so the results from this, we only have one year of data on this, and we're very excited to, to try another one in the future. Um, but the control fruit that did not receive that priming stimulus, um, you can see there's a much higher um, percentage of um, sunburn three and four, which are the high categories that result in most of the culling of fruit. Um, so more than half of this um, population fruit that we were working with um, had um, uh, sunburn level three and four damage. Whereas fruit that had received that priming stimulus um, reduced that down to about a quarter of the fruit. Um, and this was true also in uh, Granny Smith. And so uh, we hope to do this again. Uh, we, we did a second year in 2019 and it was just a year where it was a cool summer and there was no sunburn stress. So there was no way to actually look at this. And then the following year was uh, 2020. So um, we haven't been able to, to pick this back up yet. Uh, so um, the other kind of aspect that we're looking at is, is trying to understand um, the gen genetics and gene expression. Uh, and that can really help us, um, or associated with sunburn susceptibility. Um, and that can really help us to work towards developing markers um, for breeding um, and also help to inform whether um, current or new cultivars uh, will need more or less sunburn protection. Um, so uh, just to give you a, a very quick background, um, what we already know about how um, sunburn uh, develops at the cellular and molecular level uh, we know that there's a lot of involvement of a couple specific pathways um, in sunburn development. So heat shock proteins um, play a pretty big role. Um, and then um, the phenylpropanoid and anthocyanin pathways. So this, this includes um, things that lead to development of um, red color um, and uh, lignin actually also and interplays with stress defense. So we know that these are playing a role, um, but we also wanted to know um, what else in the genome is being turned on, turned off uh, in response to sunburn and how does that change over time? Um, so we were taking, we took a transcriptomic approach to try and find more, more genes that are associated with sunburn. And uh, part of the reason we did that is when we were looking at um, the, the peel tissue from apples um, that, that did experience sunburn, uh, we didn't actually see 
uh, with some of these uh, candidates that we knew should be involved, um, we didn't see a lot of significant differences um, between below and above um, stimulus. Um, so what we did, I'm just gonna kind of summarize overall. Um, we treated fruit with um, below and above uh, sunburn threshold temperatures um, and also included uh, just ambient temperature controls. Um, and then we collected fruit or fruit peels 24, 48, and 72 hours after that heat stimulus. Um, so this way we we're hoping, you know, comparing above to control temperatures, we would get information on sunburn initiation, um, comparing below to above, perhaps acclimation conditions versus sunburn conditions. Um, and then looking over time we, that we might get more dynamic information, what, what's coming on and turning off, um, what comes on early, what comes on late. Um, and so, I, you know, we get a huge list of genes back. Um, so I, I won't be able to go through all of them today, um, but we have um, the, the types of genes um, that were highly involved or showed up a lot more. Um, at 72 hours in uh, in the above uh, threshold condition were uh, defense genes, um, DNA transcription. So we know there's a lot of, of kind of signaling going on. Um, and also things that were uh, decreased were um, cellulose breakdown and uh, signal transduction. Um, we also see saw a lot of um, reactive oxygen species detoxification and, and some of that phenylpropanoid pathway genes coming on both in the below and above uh, treatments. Um, so that seemed to be, you know, any heat stress uh, seemed to turn these, these kind of pathways on. Um, so this is something where uh, we, we did the same thing, uh, the same experiment with Granny Smith. Um, so now my, my student Ramesh is working on running this same analysis. Um, so from that, we'll be able to see which of these genes and pathways are common to sunburn across cultivars um, to try and get an idea like what, what is specific to sunburn regardless of what, what tree it's in. Um, and that can be used for things like targets uh, for, for biomarkers or identifying uh, pathways, important pathways for breeding and that, that kind of application. Uh, so that same student is also working on building um, genetic maps for a population um, that was a cross between Honeycrisp and Crips Pink um, that is uh, in, in Kate's program. Um, so this has this population has a very wide range of sunburn susceptibilities, um, and he's been working to build uh, this genetic map. Um, and then can use that together with um, a lot, he's gearing up to do a lot of phenotyping this, this summer. Um, so that can be used to determine genetic loci um, and develop future breeding markers for, for sunburn susceptibility. Um, so those are kind of more longer term um, solutions. Uh, but yeah, those are kind of the different avenues uh, we're all taking to, to tackle this, uh, this issue. Uh, so yeah, so that, uh, I, thanks for listening. Um, and this, again, these are all the folks that whose work I, I featured here. Um, and yeah, I can take questions. All right. Thank you very much. Very interesting. Uh, we got a few minutes before we're at 1.30. So if anybody has questions, uh, please go ahead and jump on in. I guess one quick one I had just to start us off or... Um, Actually, why don't we let, why don't we let Glenn go? <laughs> well, I've talked enough. Your turn, Mike. I, I I'll wait. Well, I was just I was going to ask. Um, you know, you mentioned some of the sprayable materials, and I think for um, so the Northeast growers where we might not have it every year, you know, that might be a a more flexible option for them. Do you have a sense of when, what that target temperature is of, you know, is it possible for us to say we're expected to get to this temperature today? this might be a day where it's going to be worth it for you? Or do we have a, a good sense of that for different varieties? I, I don't have a great sense of that. I do know that it lasts quite a while. Um, so I think if you're kind of expecting a heat wave to come up, you can spray it on the trees and it lasts for some time um, throughout. I don't, I don't think they reapply too many times through the summer, um, but I can't give you a great number. <laughs> sure. <laughs> 
I said we have Alan here. Yeah. Hey, uh, uh, Jessica, thanks. Uh, very interesting. Um, I had an experience a long time ago when I was, um, I inherited an orchard and there were different rootstocks and there were two trees that were right next to each other and their branches were intermingled. Mm -hmm. The fruit, they were all exposed, but they were, you know, within inches of each other and all the fruit on one tree sunburned and all the fruit on the other tree didn't, even though they were inches apart. Um, yeah. It turned out the uh, tree that had the sunburn ended up going down later, and and our pathologist said it looked like root phytophthora, so mm -hmm. which could suggest maybe a water stress um, effect. Although there could be a lot of other things. Any right. thoughts on on water? I mean, you can use water for evaporative cooling, but that affects the water status also. So, any thoughts on uh, water right. aspects? Yeah, that, that's definitely something that I think with, with the soils we have out here, people tend towards evaporative cooling because we are right next to a river. And so we're like, oh, I don't, there's water, there's free water right there. <laughs> um, but I think there has, there has been problems with, with the soil having too much water in the soil. Um, so it, it definitely could have to do with that. Um, I think also uh, I think there are definitely rootstock effects going on there as well. Um, one thing that I don't, that would be really nice to see um, is, you know, tracking this for different cultivar, fruit surface temperatures for different cultivars on different rootstocks, um, but also looking across different climates. Because I, I know that humidity has been uh, factored in in building these models over here. Um, but I don't know if they've ever been kind of tested in a all the time humid environment. <laughs> um, so that that would also be very interesting uh, to see. But but yeah, that, that water may definitely be playing a role there. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. yeah, sometimes we actually get dry days. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I I was in uh, West Virginia for my first postdoc for four years, and that was a uh, it was a big change from Washington. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, on that question, I I built a model to include the humidity along with the temperature stuff. Okay. And, and what we found, what I found, this, this is all just me. It's not peer reviewed or anything, but um, the humidity in the east generally it has a huge impact and we have to get higher yeah. temperatures to get the sunburn. And so it's, it's a pretty good protection, but then again, we do get some hot dry days too. Right. Um, but my question was the number and Raxo's work and the other stuff um, mm -hmm. you guys list us, you know, about five or six cultivars and their temperature sensitivities. Is there a more complete list of those cultivar sensitivities and do you see any, that's question one, and question two, do you see any correlation between skin color and their sensitivity? In other words, do dark apples get more or less sunburn than the, the yellow apples? Yeah, that's that's a good question. I I don't know. I'll I'll look into whether there is a, a better list now. That that I'm not totally sure of. Um as far as I know, just from basic searches, I haven't seen anything that more definitive. Um, but I, I, I think that definitely, um, apples that are, that are more red and can make more of those anthocyanins, I think that does act as a bit of a protectant. Um, I don't know if that's across the board. Um, but I think, um, definitely the cosmic crisp, which gets, uh, particularly red if it's in a border row, um, seems to have a lot less susceptibility to sunburn. Um, I, but that may be an effect of the red anthocyanin. It might be an effect of a little bit thicker, um, skin. Um, so, so the way that those two things interact and not totally, um, I think that still needs some research, but the, the, we saw a lot of, um, signatures of that, those reactive oxygen species things coming up. So anything that has, you know, extra uh, antioxidants is probably going to do a little bit better, I would imagine. So the genetics seems to be a, a definitely a strong factor, not just how it looks, but what's going on on the inside. 
Right, right. All right, I, I see we're at 135. Uh, so I know we said we'd end about 130-ish. So I, I'd say this, this counts as right about that. Um, so I'd just like to thank all of our speakers today, Debbie, Jason, Jessica, uh, really great presentations. Thank you so much for joining us. And if it's all right with all of you, um, you know, I, I could send people your emails and if they have any other follow-up questions, um, you could address them that way. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, great. Well, thank you all for joining us today. And before we do head out, I know Janet wanted to plug our next meeting. So Janet, if you're still here, yep. uh, you can go ahead and let us know what we're going to ex expect for next time. Definitely. Thanks, Mike. Yeah, I just wanted to real quick mention, um, and you will be getting an email reminder on this, but this is a series. We have four of these. They're happening every two weeks. So the next one we're going to do is two weeks from now, and it's going to be um, kind of a continuation of this one, but focusing more on some of those biotic factors. So Debbie touched on this in her introduction, and then we're going to really deep dive <clears throat> sorry, into the insects and the diseases that we expect to see potentially coming up. So we have Ann Nielsen from Rutgers, and then we have Sarah Villani from North Carolina, who will be both be talking about some of those um, insects and diseases that we expect to see working their way north into New England, um, northeast. So that's in two weeks. And then um, just a sneak preview of what's coming um, four weeks from now on February 13th, we'll be talking about main disruption. And then we'll have a final one, whatever two weeks is after February 13th. So stay tuned. Keep showing up. Thanks, everyone. And we went ahead and recorded this. Um, I'll probably send out the link to that recording sometime in the next day or two. So um, we'll have that out too. All right. Thanks, everybody. We're going to call it here. Have a good day. This was great. Thank you. Sure thing.